and moderated by RLD ma'am. I'll, I'll try to address the topic uh, through a series of questions. Uh, basically, the anatomy first, uh, what is the nerve, head, what's cup, what's disc, what's NRR. Uh, then why do an ONH changes occur in glaucoma in the first place? Uh, why do we need to evaluate these changes? What's the clinical significance? Uh, how do we evaluate the ONH changes? Uh, and what changes occur per se? That's it. <coughs> So the anatomy, uh, optic nerve, has uh, four parts. Uh, this class is only about the distal 1 mm, uh, which appears ophthalmoscopically as the optic nerve head or the optic disc. Uh, these terms can be interchangeably used. Uh, optic nerve head is basically composed of uh, axons of uh, retinal ganglion cells, uh, which uh, begin originate in the retina and uh, uh, pass sequentially through choroid and sclera. Uh, as you can see in this uh, second image, uh, the fibers pass through uh, the pores uh, in the extracellular matrix uh, of the uh, sclera. Uh, and this, uh, this is known as the lamina cribrosa. Uh, the fibers, uh, the arrangement is uh, particularly important uh, because it explains why central vision is preserved in glaucoma. Uh, if you can see in this uh, image, uh, the red uh, the red box, uh, which is the lateral quadrant, it contains the papillomacular bundle, uh, which is uh, imp which is responsible for the central vision, and it is resistant to the raised IOP changes. Uh, whereas the arcuate fibers, which are present in the superior and uh, inferior temporal quadrants, uh, they are more susceptible to IOP changes. That explains why central vision is preserved in glaucoma. One minute, Pankaj. Can any of you explain the? The anatomy, the uh, pattern of the RNFL uh, nerve fibers, how they go to the disc, and uh, what significance is that uh, in a patient with uh, glaucoma? How do the arcuate fibers go? And anybody? Second years? Nobody knows the anatomy, yeah? Huh? Uh, final years, exam going? In that uh, next uh, depiction, no? Yeah. Okay. Fibers from the peripheral retina go to which part of the, enter into the disc how? Yeah, you said they go centrally, and then which part of the disc? They go to the poles, the arcuate fibers. And those from the papillar macular bundle and the nasal fibers go where? Temp Temporal. Yeah, the papillomacular bundle goes temporally directly to the disc margin, and the nasal ones also go directly to the disc margin. Why are the awkward fibers more prone for uh, more prone for damage? A punkaj? I'm direct pressure effects of the raised IOP. Yeah, effects of the raised IOP because of the arrangement, mm. because they pass centrally, but however at the periphery of the disc margin, so they're more affected rather than the central fibers. You said they are not affected at all. Is that true, fellows? The macular, uh, it, does it only happen in late glaucoma? OK, and DJ, then why do we do the, the OCT with the? The anglion cell complex you do, no? OK, myops, yeah. It is affected, but you're not able to pick it up on visual fields because the central, the six degrees are not, uh, uh, you know, defects are not evident on fields. So in order to pick up any early uh, glaucomatous damage, which may be affecting the macula, you can get a macular ganglion cell complex, which will like, uh, you know, show you even early glaucomatous damage. So it doesn't mean that it is not affected at all. The number of RGCs are more. so. It is not revealed on 
fields because how much of an RGC damage is required for it to show up on a field? How much percentage of RGC loss is required? Service? 40 percent, ma'am. Yeah, 40 percent. Okay. Go on. Yeah, so the next uh, thing to address is why do ONH changes occur in glaucoma? Uh, the raised IOP causes two effects. Uh, the first is a mechanical effect. Uh, the raised IOP pushes the lamina cribrosa backwards and uh, that compresses the uh, RG cell, RGC axons and directly inter interrupts the axoplasmic flow. The second effect is the vascular effect which causes the ischemic atrophy of the nerve fibers. Uh, what is the importance uh, or the clinical significance of these ONH changes? Uh, now, in modern uh, glaucoma diagnosis and management, it rests on uh, raised IOP visual field effects and ONH and RNFL changes. Uh, of these three, uh, ONH is uh, probably the most important because uh, there are shortcomings with IOP and uh, visual field effects. Uh, like you can have raised IOP but uh, uh, no optic neuropathy changes. Uh, like in ocular hypertension, or you could have uh, a normal IOP, but uh, neuropathic changes like in normal tension glaucoma. Uh, the shortcoming with visual field effects is that, like ma'am said, 20 to 40 percent axonal loss uh, has to occur before th these visual field effects uh, become ap apparent. So for this reason, ONH evaluation is really important, and the goals of an ONH evaluation are in diagnosing uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathy uh, to assess the severity of the damage, uh, to monitor the change uh, or the progression and to quantify the rate of change. Uh, this class is basically uh, discussing the first three of these goals. Uh, the last goal is uh, uh, what we will we might discuss in the quantitative assessment of ONH uh, parameters. Now the predictive value of ONH evaluation glaucoma for diagnosis is around 95%. And for progression, it's uh, not so much, around 85%. Uh, next, we need to uh, describe how do we evaluate ONH uh, in the first place. So clinically, uh, we can do it by direct ophthalmoscopy, indirect ophthalmoscopy, or uh, through slit lamp by microscopy with a handled lens. Uh, because of the best stereopsis with slit lamp by microscopy, uh, it, it remains the gold standard for clinical evaluation of ONH. We can use uh, contact uh, method lenses like the Goldman three mirror lens or non-contact methods uh, such as 90D or 78D. Uh, the quantitative methods, uh, just to brush through this, uh, these include planimetry of stereo photographs, uh, HRT and OCT. This is beyond the scope of this class because uh, we are basically describing the, co describing the qualitative changes in ONH. Uh, so coming to the most important part of this class, uh, what changes occur in ONH in glaucoma in the first place? Uh, the normal versus the abnormal. Uh, any optic disc uh, or, no, or nerve evaluation has to progress uh, through these 13 subheadings. Sub <coughs> uh, the size of the disc, the shape of the disc, size of NRR, shape of NRR, pallor of NRR, uh, the cup size, shape, depth, uh, the cup disc ratio, uh, where we have to talk about the vertical cup disc ratio. Then the parapapillary changes, disc hemorrhages, if any, uh, vascular signs, and finally RNFL. Now, this is a question for the third exam goings. Uh, which of these 13 parameters would be the most sensitive, which would be the most specific, and which would be like the earliest? But, but the earliest is disc hemorrhages, uh, but it's not always uh, apparent. So after that, it's RNFL changes because uh, disc hemorrhages usually precede RNFL changes by two to eight weeks. Uh, most specific is definitely NRR, and a focal notching of the NRR is the most specific finding for glaucoma. Most sensitive, ma'am, I'm not sure. Maybe it will come so, through. Increase in the cup disc ratio. It's okay. sensitive, but that's not specific for uh, yeah. glaucoma. How specific is uh, NRR loss, focal NRR loss? How much percentage of glaucoma patients would have a focal notching? NRR loss is like the most specific. 
So in the next section, we'll be evaluating all these 13 subheadings, uh, beginning with the size of the disk. Now, the first thing to address is why is the size of the disk important? Uh, it's important because uh, it is said that uh, a glaucoma is over-diagnosed in large disks and under-diagnosed in small disks. The reason is that uh, all the parameters, the cup disk ratio, the NRR area, uh, the normal cupping, all of that varies with the size of the disk. So a large disk in a, a large cup in a large disk may be normal, while even if, if there's a small cup, uh, but in a very small optic disk, that may indicate a glaucomatous change. So because of that, we need to uh, address and ma measure size in the first place. Size does matter. matter. The next thing, uh, how do we measure size? Uh, so, uh, in a direct, uh, yeah, can anybody <laughs> describe how do we measure size in a direct ophthalmoscope, in an indirect ophthalmoscope, and in a, say, with a 90D? So, in SN, we use the Vogue lenses okay, only, so never seen the Nikon. So, yeah. Uh, how do we do it in a direct ophthalmoscope? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and how do we measure it in an indirect ophthalmoscope? Hmm? <laughs> I mean, indirect ophthalmoscope gives us the like roughest estimate of the uh, disc. So <laughs> we only get an approximate value. I mean, it gives a magnificence around eight disc diopters, so we can get a rough idea about, like, looking at the whole field. Measure with the indirect. Can just get a rough idea. Rough I mean. idea. Yeah, whether it's a large one or small. Yeah. So yeah, with the direct ophthalmoscope, the smallest aperture of the five apertures, uh, the smallest aperture uh, corresponds to five uh, degrees in the field of view, and one degree is 0.3 mm. So 5 degrees is 1.5 mm or one disc diopter. So if the optic disc lies within that small aperture, it's a small disc. If it goes beyond that small aperture, it's a large disc. Uh, in a slit lamp, we use the slit beam. We measure the size of the slit beam. We use the scale to measure it. And then we add a correction factor. So of the commonly used lenses in SN, 78D has a correction factor of 1.13. And the 90D Vogue has a correction factor of 1.36. Uh, next, we need to talk about what is the normal size, uh, what is the normal variability in size, and uh, how does size change in glaucoma. So there's a huge interpersonal variability in the size of the disc. Uh, it can range from anything to 0.8 to 6 millimeters square. This is the area, actually. Uh, but uh, the normal, the a good rough estimate, the good average is around 1.7 to 1.9 mm uh, in Indians. Uh, it's largely independent of the refractive error, uh, whether it's like m moderate myopia or uh, hyperopia. But in large, in high myopes and high hyperope, uh, hyperopes, there's a variation. So the thing is that it's larger in larger discs and smaller in small sm discs are smaller in smaller eyes. Uh, once we have uh, estimated or evaluated the size of the disk, we need to look at the shape. One minute, Pankaj. So the uh, postgraduate, second years. So roughly, a uh, small disk would uh, measure how much? Huh? Yeah, less than 1.5. A uh, normal or average size disk would be? 1.5 to? Uh, say about 2.2 to 2.3. And anything more than that? would be a large disk, okay? Okay, yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, now, the normal shape of the disk is described as vertically oval. Uh, and interesting to note that the cup is uh, described as horizontally oval. Uh, there is not much of a difference between the shape of a normal uh, disk and a glaucomatous disk, and which is why it is said that like shape is the least significant of all these variables because it does not matter that much, uh, although size does. So moving on, uh, depending on the size and the shape, there are four disc patterns that have been, that have been described in glaucoma. Uh, they are focal ischemic discs, sclerotic discs, 
concentrically enlarging discs and myopic discs with glaucoma. So focal ischemic discs, uh, these will have a focal loss of NRR uh, seen as a, a notch or a, a optic disc pit and an associated visual field effect. Sclerotic discs will be characterized by a shallow saucerized cup and a sloping NRR with some peripapillary changes. Concentrically enlarging discs uh, need to be differentiated from physiological cupping. Uh, and there'll be a uniform NRR thinning. And then myopic disc with glaucoma, again, is uh, a bit of a diagnostic challenge. And uh, there's a, it, the temporal crescent of the uh, myopic uh, PPA needs to be differentiated from the beta zone atrophy. So, of course, this is just a vague descriptive uh, uh, description of the disc patterns. We'll be discussing all these changes in detail. So that is size and shape of the disc. Moving on to size of NRR. As I said, uh, larger the disc, la uh, all the other parameters change. So uh, the NRR will, will, will be uh, broader in a larger disc. And there's a progressive sequential thinning of NRR in glaucoma. Uh, inferotemporal and superotemporal areas of the NRR have the highest predictive value for glaucomatis glaucoma diagnosis. Uh, as I just told you that uh, the cup is, uh, the disc is vertically oval uh, while the cup is uh, horizontally oval. So because of this, uh, the NRR has a, a unique configuration uh, wherein the inferior uh, NRR is thickest, followed by superior, then nasal and temporal. And uh, in glaucoma, the NRR is sequentially lost and the isn't rule uh, is not obeyed in that case. Uh, even in normal eyes, the isn't rule isn't obeyed in up to 30% of the eyes. Uh, but for the other 63%, uh, the NRR is a good uh, predictor of glaucomatous damage. Also, uh, determining which uh, sector the NRR is lost uh, is of uh, significance because in early glaucoma, uh, the, the vertical NRR is lost uh, more often uh, as in the inferior and superior thinning occurs. In moderate glaucoma, temporal region NRR is lost. And in advanced glaucoma, uh, there's usually an advanced cupping, uh, but uh, more of a nasal, nasal rim is also lost in advanced glaucoma. One minute. Why is the, uh, the poles more uh, you know, sensitive to loss, the neuroretinal rim? Why does the loss begin at the poles? The cushioning effect will be uh, less in the poles. Yeah, why? What? Because there is a lack of support. Yeah, the interpo connective tissue is lesser at the poles, so the uh, the NRR loss begins at the poles. Okay. Another marker would be that uh, if that uh, central retinal trunk no is farther away from that pole, that pole will be thinner. It's not seen in that. Uh, you have a picture, huh? yeah, yeah. Uh, You have a picture later? Uh, in the vascular signs. Okay. Is that uh, central retinal trunk, uh, the vessel trunk is uh, also a mechanical support for the uh, neuroretinal rim tissue. Go on. Okay. Uh, so size and shape, uh, we just discussed, there's a progressive loss of NRR and glaucoma, so we need to look at the size and shape of NRR. Moving on to pallor of NRR, uh, before we go there, uh, first years have to answer what is the size of the normal disc and the normal cup? What's the size? Uh, what's the color? Sorry, color of the normal disc and okay, and of the cup. No. Second years. Okay, why is the normal uh, disc pink in color? Okay, choroid and vessels. Okay, and what, what's the normal cup color? Okay. <laughs> it's grayish white. So why is it not pink? 
Why is the cup not pink? There are vessels. Why is there no koroi? No. So yeah, the normal uh, disc uh, appears pink because of the reflection of the capillaries and medullated nerve fibers and the supporting glial tissue, uh, while the cup appears white gray because of uh, the lamina cribrosa, and yeah, which is part of the choroid actually. So how is there no choroid? And non-medulated fibers, the fibers are thinner at the center. <coughs> Is it clearer? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll go that. Can you please tell that person to switch off? Yeah. So why is pallor of NRR important? Uh, because it's a good dif distinguishing point between a glaucomatous optic neuropathy and non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Uh, there's something called a, a cupping pallor discrepancy. Uh, so what happens is that in glaucomatous uh, optic neuropathy, the cupping will be uh, more compared to the pallor. And in non-glaucomatous uh, optic atrophies, uh, pallor will be more than the cupping. So we need to evaluate for this. Moving on to the size of the cup. Uh, as uh, there's a variation in the size of the disc, there's uh, well, one almost... Minute, what is the significance of a uh, pale disc? When do you say that it's probably not glaucomatous? Hmm. Okay. So then what would you suspect if the... Suppose if it was advanced glaucoma and... Uh, then the, how do you differentiate then? Yeah, you have to mainly look at the NRR, okay, yeah. So the NRR is also pale, then it's probably some neurological cause, okay, yeah. So there's a large inter-individual variability in the size of the cup as well. Uh, usually it is seen that larger the optic disc, larger the optic cup too, and uh, the size of the cup progressively increase in, increases in glaucoma, so we need to evaluate for that. And it's important to remember that cupping uh, does not occur in proportion to the pallor in non-glaucomatous optic nerve damage. So again, to differentiate between glaucomatous and non-glaucomatous. Next, we move on to shape of the cup. Uh, we already discussed this in the configuration of the NRR, the disc is uh, vertically oval, cup is horizontally oval, and the horizontal diameter is around 8% uh, larger. Uh, apart from this, uh, there's not much significance to the shape of the cup as well. Moving on to the depth of the cup, uh, the optic cup uh, depth again depends upon uh, size of the disc and uh, also the size of the cup. So larger the disc, larger the cup, uh, deeper will be the cup. And uh, uh, depth of a cup uh, is an early indicator of uh, glaucomatous damage in the sense that saucerization, uh, wherein uh, there's a central pale uh, cup uh, uh, along with the shallow cupping, uh, gives a saucer-like appearance. It indicates an early sign of glaucoma. We'll see an image in some time. So now we'll just examine some of the changes in glaucoma in cup size, shape, and depth. Uh, the first, uh, this we already discussed in NRR actually, uh, there's a focal loss of neuroretinal tissue uh, or polar notching. As ma'am explained that uh, the notching begins in the poles and uh, the most common site is the inferotemporal region, uh, sometimes the superotemporal region. Uh, it has a 87% specificity for glaucoma. It's also called an acquired pit of optic nerve. <coughs> and it's uh, associated with the opposite visual field effect. So like an inferior notch will cause a superior defect. Optic disc pit, uh, we already discussed this. Uh, uh, there's a deep localized notching where the lamina cribrosa becomes visible and as you can see in that image, uh, 
those grayish pores. Uh, there's also the laminar dot sign. We'll be discussing that. Now, as the uh, this progressive loss of the uh, RGC axons uh, and this deepening of the cup and there's a, a recession of the new retinal uh, rim tissue, the lamina cribrosa area uh, uh, becomes more uh, visible. And those pores, as you can see in this photo, uh, they seem to appear larger, giving it a laminar dot, uh, giving it the name, the laminar dot sign. These dots that you see uh, with the gray shoe, that's a classic sign. A loss of the NRR uh, in the nasal uh, margins gives a sharpened nasal margin appearance. And uh, progressively, if, the, if uh, all the NRR is lost, so it just leaves behind a very thin uh, layer of uh, new retinal tissue, uh, giving a sharpened rim appearance. And a bean pot cupping in advanced glaucoma. Saucerization and tinted hollow, as we discussed, these are related to the uh, depth of the cup. Uh, there's a diffuse shallow cupping, uh, and there's, there's a uh, central pallor uh, around the area of the shallow cupping, and the rest of the cup is about the normal depth. So it gives the uh, appearance of a saucer. Moving on to cup disc ratio. Uh, this is an important parameter to assess the progression of glaucoma. Uh, but again, uh, there's a huge interpersonal variation. Uh, larger discs will have uh, uh, larger cups as well and uh, larger CDRs. And smaller discs will have uh, smaller CDRs. To correct for this, uh, there was a scale that was divided by Speth et al. It's called the Disc Damage Likelihood Scale. Uh, and the thing is, like for, for example, uh, if it's a... If it's a large disc, a 0.7 CDR may be normal for that large disc. Uh, but if it's a very small disc, even a 0.3 CDR uh, may indicate glaucoma. So to to like take those things into account, this uh, scale was devised. And the details are beyond the scope of this class. The cup what, disc ratio mustn't all be mentioned in isolation. It should always be mentioned with respect to the this size, then only it uh, carries some amount of, uh, you know, specificity and sensitivity increases. Okay. So whenever you are mentioning cup disc ratio, always make it a point to mention the <coughs> whether the disc is of uh, uh, small or average or large. Hmm? Moving on to the parapapillary changes, uh, around the disc there are two zones, uh, the beta zone and the alpha zone. Uh, it's important to remember that beta zone borders the disc and alpha zone is away from the disc. That's an easy way to remember. Uh, alpha zone occurs uh, almost in all patients. Uh, so whereas beta zone occurs in only in around 15% of eyes and a beta zone atrophy is therefore uh, more predictive of a glaucomatous uh, change. As you can see here, there's a thin rim and then there's a large uh, beta zone. And in the this was in the second image. In the third image, there's a beta zone atrophy, as well as there's an alpha zone that you can see temporally. Now, beta zone, what this is basically is a visible sclera and visible large choroid uh, vessels under an RP atrophy. And uh, this is uh, more significant for glaucoma. It's a risk factor for progression. Whereas, uh, of course, and uh, the beta zone needs to be differentiated from the myopic crescent, which we'll uh, discuss at the end of the class. Uh, peripheral alpha zone is not so significant for glaucomatous stains. Uh, what this looks like is uh, irregular pigmentation uh, because of thinning of the chorioretinal tissue. Another thing to, uh, another point of difference is that beta zone uh, atrophy uh, presents as an absolute scotoma. Uh, whereas an alpha zone atrophy presents as, as a relative scotoma. Uh, next, disc hemorrhages. <coughs> uh, these are the earliest uh, sign of glaucoma uh, when they occur, uh, but they are transient in the sense that they resolve uh, between, like after four to eight weeks usually, most commonly. Uh, the hemorrhages may appear dot blot like or flame or splinter shaped like, 
uh, dot blot when they appear within the disk margin and uh, when they are, uh, appear close to the proximity of the disk margin, they appear splinter-like. Uh, these hemorrhages are more common in normal tension glaucoma where they are called uh, Drantz hemorrhages. <coughs> and uh, as I said, they are the earliest sign uh, and they'll precede uh, RNFL changes by around uh, uh, two to eight weeks. And many a times, uh, the disc hemorrhages are the sites where the RNFL changes and the optic uh, and the notching and uh, polar notching begins. So here in, in the first image, you can see a flame-shaped uh, flame hemorrhage. In the second image, too, it's a flame-shaped. Uh, third and fourth Im images are dot blot hemorrhages, dot hemorrhages. And fourth one, fifth one, I don't know, I think it's a splinter hemorrhage. Moving on to vascular signs. And he said uh, disc hemorrhages are more common in normal tension glaucoma. Any theories on why it is commoner in a, in a low tension glaucoma than a high pressure glaucoma? Any, any? Is uh, associated with the peripheral vascular diseases like Raynaud's disease, migraine. Yeah, but it has been proven that uh, the splinter hemorrhages are not because of ischemia. Because they're not, they're, there are no other, uh, you know, corroborative uh, signs of ischemia like uh, cotton wool spots and all. Like that, uh, the in high pressure, uh, when the pressures are high, the extravasation of blood is limited. Okay, when, is in, uh, when the pressures are low, it is more and it takes longer for it to, uh, you know, resolve. So that's why they say it's more commoner in when the pressures are high. Okay, do you see it in advanced glaucoma or uh, or uh, early moderate glaucoma? Yeah, early or moderate glaucoma is when you. And what does what significance does it carry? You're seeing a recurrent disc hemorrhage. What what? Yeah. So yeah, NFL damage develop can develop. Yeah. And what else? Yeah, usually after two months. It means the disease is still active. Probably the patient requires a lower target. Okay. Hmm. Any uh, fellows, uh, postgraduates, what are the other causes of disc hemorrhage? PVD, ma'am. Diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. Then? Uh, Hypertensive retinopathy. Okay. Vasculitis. Okay. Trauma. Trauma, optic disc evolution. No, no. Other things are, uh, you know, patient is on blood thinners. Okay, and uh, any blood dyscrasias, okay, all that has to be ruled out. If you're just seeing a patient with normal pressures, with a healthy NRR, with just a disc hemorrhage, you have to ask all this history, okay? Yeah. Okay. Now we'll examine some of the abnormal uh, vascular appearances in glaucoma. Uh, it's important to know that the retinal, uh, the normal course of the retinal vessels uh, they emerge on the medial side of the cup, uh, slightly decentered de superior nasally. Uh, the temporal arteries have a, a bit of an arcuate course, whereas the nasal ones take a direct course. Uh, so first sign is, is a bayoneting sign. Uh, anybody knows what a bayonet is? Yeah, so it, this is the, the knife-like thing on the front of the gun. So as you can see, it's, it's angulated compared to the axis of the gun. Uh, so the bayonetting sign in glaucoma is when uh, the vessel, the retinal vessel, it makes a double angulation along its course. And uh, the double angulation is because of the loss of uh, supporting new retinal tissue at the margin of the cup. So as you can see in the first image, uh, it's like kinking here and then again it's kinking down there. 
as superior one to now is it only the superior one the no both are both are uh, yeah and in the second image uh, it's it's more classical in the second one uh, in the inferior vessel yeah. so that's bionating sign uh then there's a there's something called bearing, bearing of the circumlinear vessels uh now usually the vessels uh, will emerge at the margin of the cup uh, but because of the gradual progression or enlargement of the cup uh, these vessels seem to be barred from the, the cup margin and they seem to appear to run through the uh, through in between the cup so that's called bearing of the circumlinear vessels the third sign uh, we need to look for the retinal arteriole uh, diameter because there's a, a diffuse narrowing of retinal vessels in glaucoma uh, although this is not specific uh, and it could uh, include other causes such as uh, ischemic optic neuropathies and non glaucomatous uh, neuropathies then there are some non specific signs such as nasalization of the retinal vessels uh then there's tor increased torsosity of the retinal vessels and uh, something called overpass cupping uh, where the vessels uh, bridge through and then collapse into the uh, new retinal tissue uh, these are non specific signs of glaucoma uh, but need to be looked for moving on to uh, yeah this was something ma'am was explaining before uh, the level of the the exit of the central retinal vessel trunk on the surface of cribrosa and its distance from the nrr uh, that is significant for have a picture yeah no no picture for this ma'am one uh, one before this is not very obvious uh, that trunk you can see uh, the uh, superior rim is thinner and the trunk is farther away from the superior rim slightly than the than the inferior rim it's, it's almost central here but that's one uh, one way to uh, you know to indicate that uh, that rim is thinner than the other okay moving on to rnfl changes uh, now uh, retinal nerve fiber uh, layer loss uh, is probably the earliest change uh, in glaucoma uh, is the second most earliest change after disc hemorrhages uh, these rnfl normal anatomy they appear as uh, bright fine striations uh, which appear to fan off from the optic disc uh, like you can see in the image there uh, those fine striations uh, which have a brightish uh, color uh, it's important to remember that this uh, rnfl changes are not specific for glaucoma and the uh, the normal physiological uh, there's a decrease in the count of the rnfl uh, layers or exons because of uh, because they appear so early in glaucoma they are an important sign for preperimetric glaucoma uh, because it is said that uh, 20 to 40 percent axonal loss uh, usually appears uh, has to occur before uh, visual field changes up, uh, appear on perimetry so on optic nerve head evaluation if you see rnfl changes uh, this could uh, indicate uh, that in future the patient might go into visual field effects Uh, the frequency of rnfl changes it increases uh, from uh, early to moderate disease uh, but in advanced disease the rnfl changes are not so uh, significant because there is a diffuse loss in all the quadrants so uh, i mean to pick up rnfl uh, changes what we need is that the background has to be normal and, and in that localized area we we see some change in the uh, normal striations or so if that that does not happen in advanced disease because there is a diffuse loss uh, a good uh, quantitative assessment of the rnfl uh, layer can be uh, achieved by oct and polarimetry but i mean that's not within the scope of this class now there are uh, four patterns of rnfl defects uh, the most common is the wedge defect uh, slit defect a uh, diffuse loss and then there's a uh, reversal of the normal pattern 
Now, usually the superior and inferior RNFL layers, uh, the RNFL layers in the superior and inferior quadrants are uh, thickest, uh, which is why they appear uh, brightest. But when there's a reversal in this uh, thickness in glaucoma, so that pattern changes. In this one, the first image, you can see uh, a slit-like defect along with a wedge defect. In the second one, uh, you can see through the center, there's a slit defect. The third one is classical of a wedge defect. A uh, fifth image is a slit defect. One minute. Clinically, how is the RNFL layer uh, best visualized? Red free. Thing. Red free, OK. Uh, why uh, red free, but why not uh, the yellow light? Mom, the retinal pigment epithelium, um, it, um, the wavelength, um, yeah, what, with what wavelength is it best uh, seen? Green, okay, and? Blue, green. Blue, yeah, blue also. Okay, so what happens with the green, uh, with the green filter? Yeah, the RNFL reflects the green light, whereas the, the RP and the choroid have melanin, which absorbs the uh, green light. So what happens with the blue filter, fellows? It's also seen with blue. So with the blue, what happens? Actually, it's completely reflected, the RNFL uh, layer completely reflects the blue light. So you're not able to visualize it as, you know, as you're not able to see the pattern. OK. And uh, in a defect, what happens? So you, normally, you can see the RNFL in a green filter. So when there's a defect? Um, yeah, RP absorbs it. So you're seeing it as a dark uh, background. So normal, show the normal. Uh, normal, you see it as bright striations. And when there's a defect, it's a dark area, and all the blood vessels are all, the borders of the blood vessels are all well uh, seen. When it's intact, when the RNFL is intact, the blood vessels, they are a bit blurry, the borders. But when there's a defect, you can see it well highlighted. Okay, So you have to, in particular, look for it. Then only you'll able, be able to identify it. So just a uh, disc examination, just looking at the disc alone is not enough. Always you have to make it a point to assess the RNFL also. OK, yeah, go on. So in RNFL, we need to look at three things, uh, the striations, the brightness, and uh, the peripapillary vessels. Uh, these defects usually occur in around 20% of glaucomatous size, uh, more in the uh, mild and moderate glaucoma eyes, uh, very rare in advanced disease. They are also found in uh, optic nerve atrophy, uh, but rarely present in normal eyes. Uh, what we discussed so far is uh, the qualitative or the clinical evaluation of optic nerve head. Uh, but there are uh, quantitative methods uh, of the optic nerve head uh, to evaluate the optic nerve head parameters. Uh, that is within the scope of this class and my understanding. But, but the three methods are planimetry, uh, Heidelberg tomograph, and OCT. So I'll just skip this. Uh, the gold standard remains uh, scanning laser polarimetry of stereo photographs. This is a Heidelberg retinal tomograph. It employs uh, a regression analysis known as Mo fields. And then there's OCT. OK, one minute. Uh, he said the gold standard is disk photographs. So why why is that the gold standard? Why not the other newer imaging uh, modalities? Just a disk photo is not stereoscopic. Stereoscopic disk photos, that's a different thing. Why, but? Ma'am, it won't change with the machine. And that's right. It won't change with the machine. So, so that is like a baseline that even years from now, it's going to be constant. Would anybody, any of you know about stereo disc photography? Ma'am, it takes from two different angles, and then yeah. we have to uh, fuse it yes. by relaxing the accommodation so that we get a 3D idea. That's right, yeah. 
So in the OP, you won't have the stereoscope, okay, the stereoscopic viewer. So then you use a pen tip or something and uh, you fuse the image until you see a three-dimensional uh, image of the disk. That's why the AMR, now you have the disk photos uploaded. You have a right eye itself, you will have two disk photos side by side. So you can try and uh, fuse it to get a stereoscopic view of the disk. Okay, There's the stereoscope is there, you can go and uh, uh, see it and you can try and uh, see how it's done. Okay, okay, yeah. Oh, go on, Pankaj. Just to summarize all the changes, I need to do this or? Okay, may, just go on to the uh, okay. five hours. So mainly, he'll just tell you, this is the critical step in, a, in assessing a disk. So these so are the things you must uh, go by. And these are the five hours of ONH evaluation. Uh, if you want to just take something from this class, I think you should take the five hours. Uh, first, observe the scleral ring uh, to identify the rims of the optic disk uh, and its size. Then identify the size of the neuroretinal rim. Uh, examine the RNFL uh, layer for diffuse or uh, local defects. Uh, examine the peripapillary region for any beta zone or alpha zone atrophies. And finally, look for hemorrhages, uh, retinal or optic disc. Uh, these were my references. Thank you. questions so that uh, you have those vascular uh, changes now like uh, usually the vessels will pass vertically but uh, when there is uh, increase uh, the, the increased neuroretinal rim loss then it kind of goes like a horizontal course it takes okay okay fellows uh, what is the uh, dilemma with the myopic disc what are the difficulties that uh, Yeah, this cup. The cup disc ratio cannot be commented upon. Okay, the disc shape itself will be altered Shaped for one. Yeah, 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 and cup will be shallow. Disc. You can have a large disc. And, and even the peripapillary atrophy. Okay, so if you suspect a glaucoma in these patients, how would you <coughs> follow it up? a baseline photo photograph, and then we can see for the progression whether it's getting progress. Baseline photos and fields, yeah. So you follow up with that. So you uh, sometimes you may have a, you know, corresponding to the crescent, you may have some defects, but you cannot say that is a def glaucomatous defect. So you have to pro follow it up and see if there's any progression. And even that uh, the myopic crescent won't progress in size. Okay, if it is a, a beta atrophy, it will increase in size. So that area of neuroretinal thin thinning also you can have. So serial uh, photography and uh, serial uh, field evaluation. Okay. okay. Thank you, Bankaj.